All right, we're, well, it's 11 a.m., so we're gonna get started with our Outdoors with Bobby Farley's Rubio class. Um, as you all probably know by now, this class alternates between being a video that you can watch on our website or our YouTube channel, and then the next week being a live session so that you can share your adventures with Bobby and ask him questions. So if you're in Zoom, you can do that using the Q&A or the chat button. If you're on YouTube or on Kingdom Access Television or your local cable television, you can email us questions anytime before, during, or after class. And you can send them to dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org. That's D-B-U-S-H. And uh, without further ado then, I think I'll turn things over to Bobby, who is indeed even outdoors today for, for class. Yes, Drew, it's nice that I could sit out here. It's sunny and warm. And if you see behind me, there's a yellow forsythia bush in full flower right now. And over my other shoulder is that rose Daphne. That was part of the last video, if you folks uh, have had a chance to watch that. Spring is fully here, but I know that if uh, you're not used to Vermont's weather, you might be a little frustrated. We've had some nights below freezing and it might even snow this weekend. Sounds crazy, but that's what life in the Northeast Kingdom is all about. And all the creatures that live here are well adapted to this uh, spring that always comes in fits and starts. However, um, if you listen carefully, that's the spring song of a chickadee. And there's another bird that you might hear at this time of year at the same places where you'll hear a chickadee that sounds like it starts with the same notes, but it'll go, And that would not be a chickadee, even though I wouldn't blame you for thinking it was. Maybe we'll hear one too, but there's another bird called the white-throated sparrow that, that sings in a very similar fashion to the chickadee. And maybe while we're here, we'll hear them. And I think I hear another bird, a chipping sparrow behind me. But yes, birds are singing, they're setting up their territories, they're nesting, and they're trying to keep other rivals away from their nests so that they can have that place to themselves. And uh, that's part of what's going on right now. It's sort of like territorial negotiations out here, even though to us, it sounds like beautiful music. It's like battle cries, perhaps. So, so many things are happening right now out there. Um, and if you're tuned in live, I hope you get some questions in so that we can talk about what's going on. But I wanted to show you something. Um, if you have some of those weather apps that a lot of people use, I, I always recommend using the Eye on the Sky website for your weather at the Fairbanks Museum. But I, I know that there are many other weather apps that people get. And you may have gotten a notice recently about pollen counts medium to high pollen warnings and for people with allergies uh, pollen can be very irritating even though there's nothing harmful about it allergies are your own immune system reacting to something that's maybe not dangerous but treating it as if it, as if it is and uh, if you look at the warnings about the pollen that's in the air you'll notice that they're listing the species maple willow aspen and even birch, which I haven't seen my birch's flower yet, but if you've been watching our video series, you will notice that the red maples were featured and the poplars, which is aspen, quaking aspen, and um, and the willows that we talked about in all of the videos, the pussy willow, they are all blooming right now and their, their flowers are pushing pollen into the air. Some of that pollen is going to feed insects like bumblebees, and I hope you've been out there, but I've actually seen bumblebees already. So their timing is timed with those early flowers because bumblebees, like all bees, they don't just drink nectar. They also gather pollen. And for some species of bees, the pollen is much more important. So when you see a bumblebee flying around your garden, look to see if you can find those pollen packs, the bees' knees packed with pollen that they'll be collecting and bringing home to their hive. But I have a picture I wanted to share with you folks of the red maple flowers, because if you watched the first video, you may have noticed I talked about how those buds look very swollen early in the spring, even when there was still snow in the ground on the ground. And now those uh, flowers have bloomed and in many cases have passed their peak of bloom and are now starting to go high. So here's some pictures I took just the other day with a new macro lens on my phone. Let's see how they look. 
and there's the tip of a red maple twig and you can see what was those swollen buds a couple of weeks ago now bloomed into these red flowers and those long structures that you see sticking out of those flowers are the stamens that's the part that makes the pollen so they kind of look like a miniature apple flower but dark red you know they're simple shaped flowers but they can be visited by insects they do have nectar as a matter of fact guess what that nectar is the nectar that filled these flowers was once the sap running through the tree and that sap that we get in the early spring is high in sugar sugar that was stored in the red maples roots Yes, red maples, along with sugar maples and even silver maples are the trees that can be tapped around here for making maple syrup. So it's kind of cool to me that the sap that was on its way to these flowers, we diverted some into our uh, what used to be buckets and now is vacuum tubes. And that uh, nectar, well, pre-nectar, sweet water gets diverted and turned into maple syrup. But in a way, if you, the, the sap that doesn't get out of the tree into the sugar house goes up into the tips of the branches and becomes the nectar inside of these red maple flowers. So it's kind of cool how humans making maple syrup were, were part of the process of this flower. And those of you who are thinking, wait a minute, does the maple syrup hurt the, the trees? Well, everything I've read about maple sugar business uh, has told me that none of this actually harms the tree in any lasting way. I mean, there are sugar maples that are over 200 years old that still get tapped. There are some on my land that are almost that old that have taps in them. And many of those old trees that have been tapped for centuries uh, live fully and grow healthily and they don't have any serious problems. And I actually got a chance to meet some of the researchers at the Proctor Maple Research Center that UVM runs. And uh, they told me about a maple tree that uh, I, I kind of feel sorry for the tree, but they wanted to do an experiment to see if there was a maximum number of taps that you could put on a tree before it started harming the tree. And at the last time I was there, they said they had reached over a thousand holes on this poor tree and the tree still lived. So poor maple tree, but it does show you that these trees are tough. And that what we do to get the maple syrup out isn't a permanently damaging thing if done right. And the Vermonters have been doing it right for centuries. In fact, this is a tradition that goes back to long before Europeans lived in Vermont because the Abenaki folks and all of the other Native American cultures of the Northeastern United States and Canada have been making uh, syrup from maple trees for centuries, millennia probably. And maybe it was a good time for me to tell you a, a quick version of a little story um, because there is a Native American legend about a little boy whose family was starving in the spring and they had run out of food and the hunters had failed to, to capture any game. And then the little boy watched a little red squirrel. This is one of our squirrels that you may hear. Uh, in fact, my understanding is the Abenaki name for the red squirrel sounds like they're called chicory. Chicory! If you ever hear that sound, that's a red squirrel. And they, amongst the other rodents, have figured out how to get the sap out of these trees in the spring, the same time that we tap them. They don't use buckets and hoses, of course, but red squirrels like to climb out on the branches of red maples, sugar maples. In fact, I've learned that there's up to 20 different species that they do this to. And they'll nibble the twigs in the spring when the sap starts to flow. So guess what happens? Instead of uh, collecting it, it just dribbles down the side of the branch and it gets evaporated by the strong winds of winter and spring. And if those squirrels make it back to that original tree, they can lap up the maple sugar, maple syrup that's dripping down the branches as it gets evaporated. Sometimes it dries up until it looks like a brown icicle of maple sugar. And if you were a hungry squirrel, you can imagine how important that would be because by the time spring rolls around, all of the nuts, all the seeds have been eaten, all the acorns are gone. And if you're running out of food, you're going to have to wait a long time before anything fresh is growing again. So perhaps these red squirrels are the ones who invented making maple sugar. And the story about the little boy observing that squirrel up in the tree and realizing that the squirrel was eating something and the little boy climbed up into the tree to find what the squirrel was eating and he tasted it. And he ran back to his village and told the people that there was something that they could eat right now. 
And whether or not that's a literally a true story, it is an accurate description of how humans have learned so much about uh, our environment by observing other animals. And it's almost certain that at some point in the past, some of the first people to live in North America saw rodents like this red squirrel drinking, drinking that sap at the sp in the springtime. And uh, they said, why don't we figure out how to do this too? So all of these stories are, are part of what you're uh, engaging in. If you get out into the woods, you're looking at stuff that people noticed a long time ago and changed the history of Vermont and our country. Uh, so Here's the, I'll, I'll maybe see if I have another picture of the red maple flowers. So yes, uh, I want to point out one more detail in this picture before I turn it off, is that um, the flowers are already open here. But this, what you see near the top of the picture is the leaf bud that is opening. Those will be the characteristic leaves of the red maple, but they're, they're not out yet. And this is not rare around here. There's a lot of plants that flower now before the leaves come out. Um, you know, they, they have planned ahead. In the case of the maple, they had their sugar made last year, so they don't have to wait for their leaves to come out and start pumping sugar into the plant sap this year. They can get the flowering done ahead of time. And because there are not a lot of other flowers open, they have sort of a monopoly on the pollinators. All the bees are gonna be heading to the red maples. And that means they're gonna be carrying the pollen of red maples to other red maples. And the red maples don't have to worry about the pollen of, of many other species getting mixed in with them. So there's a lot of strategies that these plants, that's why the pussy willows and the maples and the aspens, the poplars, they all bloom at this time, perhaps to, to you know, beat the crowd, like the early bird special at a restaurant. Or speaking of early birds, so, as we hear the birds around me. Now, I haven't received any questions from anybody who may be tuning in live, but I hope that uh, you folks continue to go out there. Uh, my last video, uh, unfortunately, featured some creatures that are uh, not the kinds of things you wanna find outside, but are a part of life, ticks. So I didn't say it enough in the video that I think everyone who's watching this, I don't want you to be afraid of ticks I don't want you to use ticks as an excuse to stay cooped up inside of your house. Um, they're a part of life now. They weren't here in Vermont 20 years ago. Now they're everywhere. And just like uh, if you heard our chat with Dr. Giese last week, uh, he's a t an ex expert on ticks from Northern Vermont University. Every year is worse than the year before with ticks. And now both the wood tick, also known as the dog tick, which is less dangerous, and the deer tick, the black-legged tick, which is the one that I featured in my last video, they're both almost everywhere in the state. There are very few regions, maybe high mountain tops, where you can escape them. So instead of trying to escape them or stay inside, just get smart about how to handle them. And that's why I featured the website for Ver the Vermont State Department of Health's Tick Smart uh, protocols. It teaches you how to do a tick check and how to protect your property around your house. And one of the tips that Dr. Giese gave me that wasn't in the video was that ticks, they die if they get too dry. They need constant moisture. So if a tick finds itself out in the middle of a lawn on a hot sunny day and there's no shade anywhere nearby, that tick might be doomed which is sad for the tick, but not sad for us. It means that we have a way to make areas around our homes where ticks are less likely to uh, be able to survive and then less likely to be able to jump onto you. Well, they don't jump. I don't want to add that to your fears. But so uh, one thing that you can do is to keep uh, the grass low near your house. If you have lots of tall grass, the base of those tall grass stalks later on this summer will be very moist, even in a hot sunny day. And that allows the ticks to survive. But if the grass is short, well, the ticks will dry out and they'll die before they can reach the people in your home or your pets. And there's other methods too. There are some people who advocate using pesticides, but all of those things are not going to substitute what you really need to do, which is to make yourself a body check every day. Uh, you know, before before the quarantine time, I took a shower every day. So doing a tick check was pretty easy while I was in the shower. But I'm not going to lie. Uh, all this staying at home has mean has meant that uh, I, I don't necessarily take a shower every single day. And that might be true for all of you. So it's all more important that you institute your in yourself a, a tick check on a daily basis. 
the, one of the good things about doing a ch tick check every day is that even if you did get bit by a deer tick, the black legged tick, everything that I've read has said that you will, will not get Lyme disease if you get that tick off of your body within uh, 24 to 36 hours. So basically, if you do a tick check every day, if you find a deer tick on yourself and you did a de deer uh, check yesterday and you didn't, well, even though you have a deer tick that could be biting you, if you get it off that day, there's a very, very, very good chance that you will not contract any diseases from it. So there's the reason to do a uh, tick check on a daily basis. And that way, you can enjoy being outdoors without fear, without undue worry. Because uh, the ticks are the one thing that I think, uh, you know, maybe makes people want to stay inside at this time of year. But that, that would be a sad reason to stay inside. So the ticks are a problem. But there's other things happening, too, that I didn't talk about. I wanted to show you folks something that I just found. Actually, my partner, Dylan Ford, she found this in an old birdhouse that unfortunately has not had any nesting birds in it, but has had this. This is the nest of a paper wasp. There are lots of wasps and things like hornets and yellow jackets that make nests, but paper wasp nests are always opened like this, like an open face sandwich. They're not enclosed, but sometimes they'll build them inside of a structure that will protect them, like the old birdhouse on my front yard. Well, there's the other kinds of nests that are much bigger. If you see the ones later this summer that are shaped like a big teardrop made out of paper too, those are the ones that belong to the bald face hornet. And those are definitely even more dangerous than paper wasps. But one of the cool things about paper wasps and hornets is that they literally make this paper in their mouth by chewing the pulp of dead trees. So when you see these wasp nests, you might notice that they're different color sections. Some sections are bright white paper. Some sections are dark gray paper. And the color of the paper basically is an indication of wherever they were getting the wood pulp. So if they flew out to a rotten log that was, you know, light colored wood, that would be reflected in the wasp nest. And they chew the wood pulp with their mandibles. And then they use their saliva as glue and they spit it out. And there's actually a story, a folk tale from China about how the first person to invent paper got the idea from observing wasps. So I think that that story may be a folktale, but I don't think it's a fictional story. It probably is true. Humans observed something in nature and they tried to figure out if they could do it themselves and they did. Now, you know, paper, the paper that we use today, that type of paper was invented in China and it's been made in China for thousands of years. And I'm not, I'm pretty certain that the person who did invent it was inspired by these very crafty wasps. But unfortunately, according to the story, the, uh, the man who tried to make paper wa copied the wasps. He actually chewed the wood with his own teeth and then he used his own saliva blah, to glue it together. But our saliva does not stick like glue. So it was an unsuitable thing. So eventually he figured out there are other sticky substances in nature that he could use as a glue. And that is basically what paper is. It is wood fibers or other plant fibers glued together. So get inspired by nature. You might invent something new yourself that comes from watching other animals. Wasps helped humans invent paper. Should we give them some credit? Should we give them some royalties? And uh, squirrels helped humans invent the process for making maple sugar. So I hope that you continue to watch the videos that I'm going to be making. I'm going to be making another one for next week. And who knows what's going to be in those videos. But I hope you realize that it's not just, it's not just enjoyment that you get from uh, going out into the woods and looking at what's going on. You actually might get true inspiration for creating something great in your life. And that could one day help humanity. So uh, paper, maple syrup, who's next? What's next? What's the next thing that someone's going to invent out there? Now, do we get any questions, Drew, from our audience? I haven't seen any in our email so far, but I, I just wanted to remind people if they have a question before we close out class today, send it to dbush at fairbanksmuseum.org. So that's B-U-S-H, D-B-U-S-H. And um, if you're in Zoom or YouTube, you can, or excuse me, if you're in Zoom, you can chat with us. But if you're in YouTube, you can send us to that email as well. 
Um, maybe, Bobby, you can give a sneak peek for your class next week with our last few minutes here, and then uh, we'll see if we get any last questions. Well, I'm not sure about all of the smorgasbord of things that we might cover in the next video, but my plan is to head down to an old beaver pond, a place that beavers made long ago, and they abandoned it once they ran out of the trees that they like to eat, but the habitat that they created is still vibrant with other forms of life. I'm gonna be looking for some other amphibians besides the ones that we talked about, and I'm hoping to get some expert review of the pictures and videos I've taken of the vernal pool. Maybe I can get somebody to help me identify which eggs were which, and we'll maybe come back to that in addition to other uh, new things in the next video. Cool. Well, that all sounds awesome and engaging. I know people will definitely love catching that video again next Wednesday at 11 when it's up on our site. That will, will not be a live session like today. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody who's joined us this morning on Wednesday. And uh, also, of course, a warm thanks to Bobby, our host, for taking us on these adventures and getting us outside. So uh, thanks, everybody, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Drew. And uh, as a repeat of a warning from my last video, don't touch the poop of the animal scat that you see. And I should have said it in the video, but I think it should be obvious. Don't pet porcupines. Uh, you will be very sorry. <laughs> Your veterinarian can tell you all about how hard it is to take those quills out of the skin of dogs. And uh, a couple of days after I made the video, my dog, Bing Bing, who's now become a sort of star of these videos, he decided to run up into a porcupine and he got one big quill stuck in his nose. So it's not, it's not his first time, but, you know, I think he eventually will learn. Our other dogs have learned to leave the porcupines alone. My, my youngest one, Bing Bing, is still exploring uh, the possibility of trying to catch one <laughs> foolishly. So anyway, Drew, thank you very much for hosting this. And thank you, everybody. Please send us your questions and stay tuned for the next video coming up a week from today.